Welcome to the Book Pub Podcast. This is a podcast where we... My name is Leslie. And my name's Madeline, just in case you were unclear about the we part. (laughs) Uh, Talk about an author and the books that they wrote while enjoying a nice cocktail. (laughs) We'll figure it out one of these days. (laughs) What this intro is. You're listening to the Book Pub Podcast. (laughs) I just love that. We... Y'all are our best friends now. You know us already. It's so uh-huh. great. Even if it's your first time listening, <laughs> you're our to best the- of friends. Welcome to the Best Friends Club. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we do. That's what we do. Cue we... the theme music that we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> so we're a circus themed. <laughs> I guess so. And what's great is that we definitely always start this podcast off sober. And we kind of still don't, like, get crazy with it because we sip a cocktail, but it definitely starts off like we're basically drunk, but we're not. No, we're We're just just silly. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I always love about it. We just start off silly. And so today is Leslie's pick. Yeah. And we are doing... Vladimir Nobokov. Okay. And I'm glad... Leslie's gone on past tangents about how we don't need to, like, do a drum roll or, like, unnecessarily introduce these <laughs> authors, because it is in the description, That's probably people. why you might have picked this episode. Name. Yeah. <laughs> but to have... I wanted you to say it so that we knew how to pronounce it. Yes. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like that's how you, Nobokov, like that's how everyone says it all the time, I think. Sure, so. sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah. I just love that, <clears throat> that sense of confidence right there. It's how we say it, I think. <laughs> and uh, what cocktail are we pairing with this awesome Russian men? Oh, yeah. And I will say, so he is a novelist, poet, and etymologist, best known for writing the book Lolita. And he may have inadvertently invented emo- emojis. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I figured I have to like throw one of those like fun facts in the beginning so people are like, what? And want to keep listening instead oh, of like always throwing them in at the end and being like, if you didn't listen to the whole thing, you didn't hear all this like cool shit that you can use for your own cocktail party when somebody brings something up and you can be like, well, did you know Vladimir Novikov? This blah, blah, blah. is, yeah, this is basically a <laughs> podcast that will help you be a better cocktail party person. Yeah, exactly. Because then you can you host can cocktails. Cocktail. Yeah. You can have interesting uh, literature conversation yeah uh question <laughs> even if you never read oh. the book <laughs> yeah even if you've never read a book this will help you <laughs> um entomology isn't that like ants or bugs or bugs. something okay yeah. so he yeah. he was a guy that liked bugs cool he studied I like it. a lot of bugs i just yeah. want to make sure because you know there's so many ologies out there yes and, and so that's what i named my cocktail kind of after oh cool um because he specifically when well, you know and i'll get into it was um Lipidology, lipidology, mm, which is mm, the study mm-hmm. of butterflies. Not liposuction. No, not liposuction. Okay, good. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> butterflies, liposuction. Yes. I prefer butterflies. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I named the cocktail Lepidonovikov. <laughs> so here's this one. <laughs> we have that cocktail party. Sound really great talking about this author Mm -hmm. and then get a little tipsy and then just have a competition to see who can say that cocktail name lepid (laughs) novkov sure yes combination of his name and uh butterfly Butterfly studying (laughs) (laughs) so okay and so this drink is really strong so it is three ounces vodka 70 uh, 0.75 ounces blackberry brandy and 0.7 75 ounces saint germain um, oh, wait, I thought you said that you accidentally did. Oh, but so, so the shot that I have is 1.5. And so oh. when I put in three, but oh it's... Oh, my God. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, now yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I almost... I, I tried to poison Madeline with too much vodka Apparently. earlier. <laughs> Welcome. We're going to record today and you'll die. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. So, it's but really yeah, that's what it is. It's... Um, it's got like a pale pinky kind of look to it. It's you know? pretty. Yeah. And it's I put really a lime pretty. slice in there because I felt like that was a kind of a fun little decoration. Well, with the and lime citrus. slice too, it kind of like breaks up this color scheme a little bit. Mm, and so yeah. it becomes this kind of like 
ombre looking. Yeah, it comes ombre, right? It's like lighter at the bottom, darker pink up at the top. It's pretty. It looks sophisticated. It reminds me of summer, by the way it looks. Yeah. And I was stoked on some of those pictures that we took. So <laughs> it's a photograph-worthy cocktail. So yes. thank you, Liptakoff. Lip, 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 Novikov. Lip, lip, to Novikov. Novikov. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't say the name anymore, stop drinking. Them. <laughs> you probably only need one anyway. <laughs> All right. So Look that, I am. Woo! That is delicious. Mm-hmm. That's delicious. You get what I like about it is the berry flavoring, that blackberry flavoring mm-hmm. with the elderflower from the Saint Germains. Yeah. It's actually a lot sweeter than I thought it would be. Right? A yeah. lot sweeter than what I thought you would ever make. Yeah, yeah. But well, it's yeah. good. Yeah. And I feel like if you wanted to make it sweeter, you could do something like add some cherries to it or whatever. This is another <laughs> one, and I know we've talked about this before, that we kind of need like the floating flower garnish. Exactly. It really needs a flower garnish. It really does. Yeah. I need to buy something like that, like little, I don't know. Anyway, that's a future thing. <laughs> I actually watched a video on how to um, make them like sugary so that they're kind of more of that sugary Ooh. look to them. Oh, yeah. Homemade. So they kind of sparkle. Mm-hmm. And stuff. Oh, that'd be cool. See, that's what this, what this needs. All right. So Vladimir Novikov was born April 22nd, 1899. Shut up. It's like you planned this. I know, right? I'm like, so I'm going to make sure that this is released on April 22nd, <laughs> 1899. <laughs> Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. In St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. (laughs) He was born in Russia, obviously, with Mm -hmm. the name. name. (laughs) Uh, His father was a liberal lawyer who wrote many books on criminal law and uh, politics. And his mother was an heiress to a gold mine owner. Oh, stop it. Yes. Okay. So they're living like fancy Russian life. Yeah. Like, this sounds like the bourgeois of russia but they're also more on the liberal end so they weren't so yes so let's get into that a little bit they're obviously part of because i feel like just if you're part of the bourgeoisie class Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily predetermine what your political beliefs are right and then and how things are going to fall out when of course as you know we know in Mm -hmm. 1916 everything goes to shit in russia yes and so (laughs) and so they're kind of um yeah (laughs) <laughs> you know the Rus- russian aristocracy um and all of that but hi- yeah but because the father was part of the constitutional democratic party so, so that probably helps them hopefully so well, well you know while there's a monarchy it's not so you know hot like but they're you know so they're those weirdos that are like oh we would rather have a constitutional democracy than have this monarchy you know <laughs> and it's <laughs> I loved your Russian accent. <laughs> I was trying to just do a pretentious accent. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it came off as a Russian pretentious a little... <laughs> accent a little bit there. It's definitely quirky. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, so when so Vladimir and his siblings received a trilingual education, learning both English and French and Russian at a young age. Wow. Um, in fact, actually, he was... Uh, better at writing and reading in English before he was at writing in, in Russian. Mm. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why a lot of his books are later written mostly in English. <laughs> well, that's what you yeah. first said to me. You're like, yeah. this isn't actually an English written book. And I was like, taken aback. But now it makes sense. <laughs> yes. Um, he was the eldest of five siblings and he was considered the favorite. I know. Don't your parents just like their children universally it, right so yeah, why was, do you have to have oh that's considered the favorite like back in the 1800s they definitely yeah. said that it's like don't you like all your children yeah aren't equally? you supposed to not like i mean did you poll all the children and, and everyone <laughs> voted you know a secret ballot and decided oh vladimir is the favorite you yeah. know we all know we all know <laughs> 10 points for gryffindor yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> gryffindor is the favorite obviously <laughs> in the harry potter books but so that's the point yeah Strange world. Um, so, but his so one of his, his sister Olga was actually friends with Anne Ryan when they were kids. Oh, how fun! Oh, I yeah. love these literary connections that we keep making. It's so I know. much fun. Yeah, <laughs> like it's literary so friends were friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, it's like he wasn't friends with her, but his one of his younger sisters. Well, like, like yeah, yeah, like the still. six degrees of separation, like the literary world, just kind of like it's kind of like they they hang mm-hmm. out, they hang out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, for the most part, he had a happy childhood and obviously a very privileged one. 
Uh, his family was Eastern Orthodox, but as soon as he had no interest in religion, his family let him stay home instead of, you know, going to temple, church, whatever. You know, they're just kind of like, that's cool. Do what you want. Embrace your own philosophy and ideology. Yeah, cool. I'm down. These yeah. parents sound pretty legit. Yeah, they're, they seem, yeah, pretty cool. Um, Except for the part <clears throat> where he is the favorite. Other than that... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Pretty um, cool. Yeah, and his family would travel regular, regularly, which developed in him a deep curiosity about people and nature, and ultimately leading to a love of reading, writing, and butterflies. So it just hit me. So he loved nature, and he became an et- et- entomologist. Yeah. And on his birthday is Earth Day this oh year. Oh my God, mm-hmm. you're right. Mm-hmm. His birthday is Earth Day. Yeah. That's pretty freaking cool, man. Yeah. Go Vladimir. <laughs> Go Nobokov. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the reason I kind of struggled with saying that word and stuttered a little bit was, is it is there an N or is it E-T? Is it entomologist? E-N. It's yeah. e- entomologist. E-N-T- okay. Yeah. Entomologist. Yeah. I was struggling. I was like, is it an N? Is it an E-T? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I definitely yeah. didn't mean to and do And then it's like, stuttering. do you pronounce the N? I don't know. I don't yeah. Know all those I words. Just, <laughs> don't want to make it look like i'm making fun of anybody i'm no. just i was actually <laughs> legitimately struggling so when he was 17 he published his first book of poetry but this woman zenaida Higibus, who is a famous russian poet at the time was talking to vladimir's father about his poetry at a party and said quote please tell your son that he will never be a writer oh shut up oh i love it when people are told that at a young age and you're like watch me bitch (laughs) definitely why i have it tattooed on my foot yes sans the bitch part (laughs) yes i love this story keep going yeah right it's like who's zenaida higabus i mean there's probably a lot of people who know who she is or something but like still we do know a little bit more like vladimir and lolita exactly (laughs) exactly oh yeah mic drop so then we get into like 1917 and, you know, Russia goes to shit and mm-hmm. it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're not a history podcast. We just do the history of an author. Um, but essentially during the February Revolution 1917, Nobokov's father becomes a secretary of the Re- Russian pro- provisional government. But then the um, because that's that's when you kind of do have constitutional democracy, you know, um, you know, becoming in charge of the government in Russia. But then you have the October Revolution, which is when, you know, the Bolsheviks and the communists and all the, you know, angry animals oh. from Animal Farm go get, become in control. <laughs> the pigs come walking in on their hind legs. <laughs> yes. We are in control. <laughs> And so, yeah, so then, so because of that, um, you know, it's terrible. His family is completely fucked and, um, and which so is interesting. They get, they get out. <laughs> I wasn't expecting the family to be fucked because they were part of, but see, that's so then when, yeah, when the communists come in, it's all like, well, we hate all of, you know, the bourgeois and stuff like that. That's when you get like Anastasia and everyone hates, or yeah. that was earlier, but still, you know. But, but yeah, because bu- we, like, we hate the bourgeois still, so like, much, we need to get rid of them and have, you know. Even if the, what they stand for is something that similarly aligns with what right, we're doing. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, don't we all just want, like, a better government than before? And then. Just not know. having a monarchy that, like, makes us all poor and sad. Yeah, exactly. Um. So, interesting. But no. uh, oh, Russia. Yeah, that's why it's very scary and sad. Yeah. Um, okay, so they get out. So they get out. They get. And he's like, kind of what? He well, uh, he's eighteen. Yeah. Okay. So okay. he he spent all of his childhood, but now, yeah. So now he's he's eighteen, um, and so they go to get exile in you know western europe yeah and so in 1918 the family moves to germany and vladimir enrolls at trinity college at the university of cambridge in england um so you know because he's you know he is kind of an adult now so it's like they all get out of russia family moves to germany he moves to england I feel like he made a good choice in that one yeah because you know what's happening right about now, too. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's not so good. you're going from Russia's crazy to... Let's go to Germany, guys. Germany, it's probably going to be great World there. War I happening. <laughs> right? Exactly. It's like, no, well, no, 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 don't go there. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, the the country falls into actual, like, fully economic <clears throat> ruin. Yeah, they made... He made the better choice. He was mm-hmm. a smart guy, clearly. And he, he, you know, he wanted to be educated. He wanted to go to school. So he decides to study zoology. Shut up. I love him. <laughs> 
Um, but then later on, he switches from zoology to Russian and French literature. Oh, my God. Please tell me he's handsome. I need to be able to hit on oh, this man, he, even he though he's had, dead. He was kind of a cutie. I feel like I haven't seen any pictures of him when he's younger, but I feel like he's he's kind of a cutie when he's older. Like, you know, like some people are real ugly when they're old and mm-hmm. like he was, he was a cute he old man. He like the fine wine that he is. Yes. Oh, yes, exactly. Okay, Cause I'm so in love. So I really hope he's a he's, cutie. He is such a wonderful, beautiful nerd man. I, I love know. him so much. Um, <laughs> I'm so into this. He's like I told you animals. I was going to freak you out in this one, yes. but uh, I didn't tell you what, level of freaking out it was going to be at (laughs) and knowing you i kind of assumed it was going to be like a great sad story where there's no yeah, like a norman mailer stab your wife thing exactly (laughs) and so i was kind of prepared for that and uh so i was like cool bring on the strong drink now i'm like "Eh, strong drink be damned i'm in love (laughs) um so he did really well in school although he would later call his degree quote one of the few utilitarian sins on my conscience (laughs) oh god i love it okay (laughs) i mean i'm all for being educated but definitely like you know i i I totally get where he's coming from too yeah he's like you know i i could have done this without like doing this like (laughs) wasting my time over here exactly I mean, yeah, if you have, like, the drive to be interested in things, then it's kind of like, you know. (laughs) Do it, but also at the same time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to fit into the construct of education. You can, if you are willing to educate yourself and drive for yourself, then just do it. Yeah, it's it's a goodwill hunting thing where it's just like... You know, these kids are enrolled in the school and they get these degrees and they're dumbasses. But then like Matt Damon is like just just this genius, you know, and he's just the janitor because it's like he actually believed in the learning, you know, Mm -hmm. the process. But Mm -hmm. like, you know, he doesn't have a degree, but he's smarter than all of them. How about them apples? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. My mom is one of the smartest people out there and she got a, a trade school. She didn't yeah. go out and like become like this giant. And she's so bachelor. well read. Yes. You know? So yeah. it's like, yeah, she didn't need to go to be like, I'm going to Yale and I'm going to get an English degree. It's yeah. like, no, she basically has that degree without having that degree. You exactly. Know I mean? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like you. Yeah. Oh, God, I love this episode. <laughs> All right. So after college, he joined his family in Berlin in 1922. Okay. <laughs> Again. <laughs> timing choices but okay yep yep (laughs) and that same year his father who is still involved with like the constitutional democratic party but like but so it's like you remember with Pablo Neruda where it's like these people will do this stuff like in exile where they have they're part of the political party for like this other country but you know so that's so he's part of the constitutional democratic party in exile um okay yes i do remember that so, yeah okay. so that so that's a thing that happens and um and so that he his father's at this political meeting and these two men show up to assassinate the party leader um pavel milkov i want to say that. <laughs> sounded pretty milkov <laughs> And um, so these two assassina- assassinators, ass- assassins, <laughs> they shot at Pavel and Novikov's father jumped in the way and is killed. <gasps> Shut up! No! Yeah. Oh my God, he died here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, yeah, and so that's even something that comes up a lot in like Novikov's like work is like that kind of death where like, someone sacrifices themselves or mistakenly dies for another person. Um, But he would never admit that it comes from that event. But obviously that was very significant in his life is that he he goes back to join his family after being away for like four years. And then that same year, his dad is like kind of assassinated or, you know, save someone from being assassinated. Wow. I only see that stuff in the movies. I've never heard of a real life situation. I know. I'm like, Oh, that's crazy. Like, someone actually consciously said, like, I'm going to step in front of this bullet. Like, you do, you mm-hmm. see it in movies, but those are actors. Yeah, and I'm not, it's like, not my job either. I'm not, like, Secret Service or something. Like, this is, Yeah, like, I haven't been I'm trained just, to do this. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just a lawyer, like, p- political professor kind of guy, and I'm going to go say, like, <laughs> wait, wow. what, what, win one for the, the nerds, too, there. Of, yeah, like, right. Being, like, a super badass hero, like. <laughs> right. Oh, my God, I'm so into it. <laughs> oh gosh 
Um, so also in 1922, he met a woman who is the first love of his life, but her family refused to allow them to marry since they didn't think he would make much of himself as a writer. People just really, really lowballed him. <laughs> they were just like, looked at him, you're like, no. Yeah, you're not going to no, be a writer. you're not going to be a writer. Then in 1923, he met a Russian Jewish woman named Vera Slonim. I'm going to call her that because I'm going to skip the middle name. It's okay. like effervescentia. <laughs> effervescentia. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I added a couple little letters in there. Okay. <laughs> I like that. That's the what idea it kind of looks like. It looks like a name of a weird perfume that I wouldn't know how to pronounce. Mm. But I like the idea of effervescent because then, like, mm. she's bubbly. Maybe she's got a bit bubbly personality. Yes. And so she, so she's Russian Jewish, and uh, she lived in Berlin, too. And she worked as a translator for Russian literature, which is probably how they met because some of his early work that he was doing in Germany was also doing Russian um, literature translation into, like, English and French. And he didn't really know German, but, you know, like, yeah. people in Germany were into that, I guess. Makes sense. Yeah, so meets her, falls in love, and... Uh, Second love of his life. Yes. Okay. This woman, this woman's actually like, yeah, no, I'm down, I'll get married to you, and I don't really know where her family is, so it's like, I guess I think she, because she was an immigrant, too. She, you know... Got so. out of Dodge and then entered Dodge again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By yeah. entering Germany as a Russian Jew. Yes, in 1920s, in the 1920s. That's yeah. where we are. So, Russian Jew, was, 1920s Germany, tiny like, thank this. God I escaped Russia... Um, I'm going to settle down in my job as a translator. As a Russian Jew in Germany. Yeah. Where the rise of Nazism is happening. <laughs> Imminent. <laughs> Imminent happening. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So for the most part, he hated Berlin. Uh, he never learned German. Um, and he just hung out with like other like Russian immigrant circles, you know, communities and stuff. Um, and he started to be kind of become well known for his writing. So, but in order to like supplement his like writing income, he would work as, okay, it was a bunch of different things. He would give lessons in tennis and boxing. He worked as a film extra and he taught English and Russian. He is dreamy. Yeah, isn't it? It's like, okay, you do these like phys- like tennis and boxing. One, two of my favorite sports. Super um, fun. Also <laughs> really good for like cardio for tennis and yes, boxing. You build up nice you. Yeah. muscles. Yeah, so you he's get the got build strength. stuff going mm-hmm. on. I bet he was hot when he was younger. Oh God, yeah. And then he's also like a nerd who's just like had a really cool family and he's just like yeah. just a writer. And then, he, and then he also did like film extra stuff, like German films or something. Like, oh, I, I think it's him. so cute. <laughs> he's so cute. <laughs> so in 1925, he and Vera got married and Nobokov start to realize that he preferred to write prose instead of poems. Because up to this point, he was only writing a lot of poems that, you know, so. I feel like a lot of authors do both and then they find the one that they want. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm a journalist. And then it's like, oh, actually, I want to do fiction. And actually, now I want to do like really abstract fiction poetry. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is great. You should, you know. You should. Because <laughs> you don't know what will be the most intriguing and challenging and rewarding and like for best you. for your style you know and it's like just maybe because you start off being like a poet but like maybe your style like how you want to like convey the thoughts in your head the stories should come out in in a you know a, a, a play or something like Shakespeare mm-hmm. Shakespeare started as a poet yeah you know and and it's like well that's why Shakespeare like writes the way that he writes is because he was a freaking poet yeah you know? <laughs> and then he started plays and that's why I think like with Ernest Hemingway, he yeah. was journalist. a journalist, yeah, novelist, great. but then he starts doing more of those like short stories and it's like his short stories are really good. His short stories are the best short stories ever. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, dabble people, dabble. If yeah, you're a writer yeah. out there, just dabble. Yes. You never know what'll stick. Even if you're not, just do it anyway. Like just have fun. <laughs> just write. Bleed all over the page, like however you want to. Brain dump is what I'm calling it. Bleed <laughs> a brain dump. Nice. So uh, yeah, so he gets married. He decides to write prose. So his first three novels are all written in Russian and he wrote them under the pseudonym uh, Surin which is the name of a mythological Russian half-woman, half-bird creature thing. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Gender-bending, too. I like I it. It's like, ooh, okay. Instead of, like, a woman having to write under a man's name, yes. he's a man writing <laughs> under a woman's name. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, because it's... Um, Ma- S- woman slash bird. S-I-R-I-N-E. And so it's like... So it kind of looks like it could be kind of masculine, but maybe it's also, like, a nice little nod, like, to people who are, you know... I mean, I guess everyone who's reading it, because it's written in Russian, is probably Russian, but it's kind of, you know, just, like, fun and cool. And, and of course, you know, nature theme. 
of like half bird, you know, half woman, mm-hmm. half bird, which mm-hmm. sound, sounds so cool. That sounds yeah. better than mermaids, like <gasps> flying magical women, like we're half animal. <laughs> Leslie, you did just stab me in the heart. <laughs> I know. I love mermaids, you know? You know that like being a mermaid is like my life's ambition <laughs> and has been. Why do you live in the mountains? We should be serenes or serenes or whatever instead. I just always wanted to be a mermaid. I want to be like half eagle. I think it's safe to say I could potentially sell my soul to become a, a mermaid. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I would. I think I could say that safely. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be a mermaid. That's what I wanted. <laughs> Every time I wished upon a star, went under a tunnel. Mm-hmm. Can I please be a mermaid? No. In uh, in fifth grade, I had a quote unquote, big quotes, boyfriend. <laughs> and he broke up with me. And then we ended up at a pool party, birthday party. Mm-hmm. And I pretended to be a mermaid to try and win him back. Oh, cute. That's the way to do it, girls. That's how bad I you're a mermaid to get your ex-boyfriend back. (laughs) Especially if you're, like, in third grade. (laughs) And he called me back, like, a few days later, and I said, no. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Yeah. I realized what was more important to me was being a mermaid. Yeah. And then I stayed single for the next, like, seven to eight years. (laughs) You know, that's besides the point. (laughs) You're never single if you have a good book. That's true. Oh. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> I should get that on a on a book bag to take to restaurants nice. when I take my book out on a on a date. Yes, I do actually do that. Nice. It's time to it's time to commit with this book I've been seeing lately. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna take that one out. Yeah. I ask my book, do you want a second glass of wine? Mm-hmm. Of course you do. Yeah. Oh, I'll drink some of it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're <laughs> weird. <laughs> All right. So uh, those first three novels written in Russian, um, those are the only novels he would write originally in Russian. One novel he wrote during that time that I'd like to point out was called The Defense. And it's all about this like protege chess player who eventually has a mental breakdown and can't separate life from the game of chess. (gasps) And this is somewhat significant because Novikov had a obsession with chess as a kid before deciding to like give it up. Uh, this novel also gained him a lot of recognition as a writer, um, so he, he didn't have to, you know, work as a tennis instructor and boxing instructor and, you know, all of that kind of stuff anymore. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. and I like that, especially, like, oh, interesting with the Queen's Gambit out right now. Yeah. There's, like, a push for chess. Mm-hmm. Ooh, so re- we Novikov, need to read this. The Defense, and I'm... I think he translated it in English himself because he was better at English. So he, he, and actually that's something that comes up, like, like he, all of his early stuff that he wrote in Russian, he translated himself into English because he was better at English anyway. And so he's like, I'll just do it. Because <laughs> well, why not? Like, I know how to speak English really well. Well, and like the thing with translations too, it's not necessarily like a word for word thing. Mm-hmm. It's how to convey the message correctly. Because yeah. there's words that don't translate. Yes. Like the meaning of this is different than this, but it doesn't mean emotionally the yeah. same. So I'm glad that he did that because then his same emotions could be there. Yes, 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 exactly. And I think he, he even talks, he wrote an essay about that, which is like really fun and cool. It's like, oh my gosh, oh yes, translation. You're so cool. <laughs> yes. It's like he makes me want to learn new languages just so I can like <laughs> be like, oh yeah, the difference is the nuance, blah, blah, blah. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and I also want to point out, so then um, his... His seventh novel. Wait, why do I write this here? Because I just said his first three novels. It, well, he wrote, I will say, I don't know what I did here. Maybe I was like, I was messing around with like the order of and what I was cutting and, and you know, and so I must have cut some stuff or something that I didn't think was like that relevant or important <laughs> for an hour long podcast. <laughs> this is a little backstage notes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically in his, during his time in Berlin, he wrote eight novels. Wow. Um, yeah. So the first three in Russian, the rest are all in English. Okay. Um, so his seventh. So at seven. Yeah. So it's seven. He wrote this novel, Despair. And today it's considered one of his best. It's like right under Lolita because everyone considers Lolita like the best. You know, it's the most well known and, you know, it's pretty easy to read. Um, and uh, so Despair, considered one of his best. And it's where he originally developed the concept of an unreliable first person narrator to like this totally crazy point. Because like the narr and it's only amplified because the narrator is actually 
has this like obsessive personality and he imagines himself as this artist who can like commit the perfect murder and everything very oh. yeah and so you're just so you're only hearing from this like narcissistic psychopath like from their perspective of the world and and this was like one of the first times this is done or um i don't know if it's necessarily the first time but it's like a very like in intricate intricate and like complex way to really do a first person narration um That's as opposed unreliable. to yes unreliable first person narration because yeah. you don't see that a lot yeah because a lot of the, like when you have things like catcher in the rye which is technically like unreliable narrator but it's like you get so many hints of like how this person's unreliable mm -hmm. you know as opposed to like totally you know like yeah if like the crucible was written as a by book abigail. and but written by abigail like it would it would come across completely different and there'd be all this fabrication and lies and so how do you separate the lies that this person is telling from like the truths of the things that actually happened you know and all of that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. so it's you know very complex well that's why which sounds it, really it's, fucking fun <laughs> to do a shout out to a previous episode with shirley jackson mm -hmm. that's why i struggled so much with haunting of hill house because she was such an unreliable character yeah yeah who was losing her mind yeah and you're like I feel like a lot of novels need to have it said on like the book jacket or something like, you know, just to let you know, this is an unreliable narrator because I think a lot of people will read things from that um, kind of narration and they'll, they won't realize it. And so they'll be like, what, why is this person promoting this horrible shit and all of that? And it's like, <laughs> you need, you know, instead of like for themselves realizing, oh wait, this, I'm not supposed to listen to this first person narration. Like this isn't like, you know a truth yeah um and uh and like which is like real life you know hearing a story from one person's perspective is still one perspective and I, that's what i love about unreliable narrator novels like they're really fun to read because you're like i don't know if this is true or not this is fun you know <laughs> yeah and and the haunting of hill house was the first time i've experienced that and it was just it's jarring it's like super super jarring yeah and uh because you're supposed to trust the i you're to, narrator yeah, you're, person you're, 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 you're you putting should. yourself in that person's <laughs> shoes. You're trusting yourself with this character mm -hmm. and you can't. And it's very jarring. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So despair. I got to go into it and see if I can handle another unreliable yeah. first person narrative. But it's like, it should be fun because it's all murdery and cool, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So at this time he wasn't making much as a writer, even though he's like, you know, he's kind of getting like a little good career in a sense but he's not making a lot much he's not like super famous or anything and but for with any of the extra money that he did make he would use it for butterfly hunting expeditions so he'd uh wait is he killing the butterflies uh yeah because he's studying them he'd like you know get some extra money and then like go out into like the woods or somewhere else you know i don't know i don't really know the landscape of outside of Berlin, you know, just areas that he knew that there was like different butterflies, different seasons and stuff. He didn't actually didn't have a driver's license. He never had a driver's license. Oh, wow. And so his wife would drive him out to different spots that were like, loyal known. Wife. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> like, honey, okay. Can you take me out for the weekend? We're going to go butterfly hunting. And like, <laughs> and so he'd go out, you know, in these places and he'd spend his free time, like catching butterflies and studying them okay. for fun. That's yeah. what he did for fun. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. For fun, he's going to go somewhere to a meadow, catch some butterflies, and study them. <laughs> and he probably didn't kill a lot. He probably, like, really only had, like, two or three that he probably wanted to study, study. Yeah, but I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it's not like, yeah, he's going to catch, like, all of the butterflies. It's more like, oh, I don't think I've seen that butterfly before or something. Or I don't know. Who knows? He probably, I would say probably over his lifetime, he probably killed, like, hundreds of thousands of butterflies, like, to be real. But, like... <laughs> But, you know, it's not that bad in the significance of probably how many butterflies he's seen in his entire life. <laughs> Sorry, isn't that the whole theory of butterfly flaps its wings? Yes, and how he's killing them so you won't die tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that's true. Okay, now no, you put it that way. Yay! <laughs> so in 1934, uh, Vera gives birth to a son, Dimitri. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Dimitri, a cute name. Despite not really liking Berlin very much, they lived there from 1922 until the late 30s when, ha ha, what do you think happened oh, in the late 30s? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Nothing significant in nothing, Berlin. Nothing that has been written about, <laughs> studied, talked about. One of the biggest moments in history. Yeah. 
So, I mean, yeah. And so it's like Vera, she's fired from her job in 1936 because oh, she's Jewish, yes, you know? Yes. And I was waiting for this ball to drop. Exactly. There had to, yeah. there had, there, of course that moment's going to come. And yeah. so, so they decide to book it to Paris. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, well, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> wait, let's talk about this. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. 1936. They're going to go to Paris. Yeah. Now. Probably again. It took me a second. It took me a second. I got excited thinking they're getting out. Yeah. But they went to the city that no. was probably one of the top five to be negatively impacted. Yes, exactly. So. Well, shit. <laughs> Sorry for the language, but I got way too excited and had a very sad letdown right there because I'm loving his wife. I'm loving him. Yes. I'm picturing this just like gorgeous, big, strong Jewish Russian woman who takes her husband out. And then when he's running around catching butterflies, she's sunbathing, reading good literature and Mm -hmm. having a glass of vodka and and a good cold sandwich. Like, I'm like, I want to be with her. I see it. Yes. Oh, totally. Sorry, that was like totally where my mind was at like <laughs> two minutes ago. Nice. Yeah. So, so I want her to be. They protected. basically, yeah. They they uh yeah. So they go to Paris, and then in 1940, they're like, oh, we should not be in Paris anymore. <laughs> um, okay. At least they're seeing somewhat of the writing on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, oops, nope, this was a bad idea. Oh, and so I do want to say, um, uh, that yeah. Before we go back to 1940. <laughs> Okay. Then, um, you know, in his barely successful first eight novels or whatever, um, like, um, (laughs) hold on to that sentence really fast. Uh, the, like one of the major themes that occurs in a lot of this work is like man's struggle with art. You know, I mean, if you kind of see it, you know, like the idea of the chess player thing, you know, this guy who envisions himself as an artist, even though he's a murderer, you know, but he sees art in his murder, you know, and, um, you, and so it's like understanding the art that happens is like central to understanding his novel, like whatever novel it is that he's writing, you know? So yes. So when you do a little side eye on like Lolita, <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> You know, exactly. like there, there is kind of that stuff is important to the novel. So like Lolita, it's, it's like kind of a, she does acting and dance and stuff like that. Okay. And so there's the performance of things and, and, uh, and so then perf- be the performance and how do you, you know, and, and perverting the idea of performance becomes part of, you know, the central message of like Lolita and how it's like this idea of like showing love in a certain way, but perverting it with like pedophilia dirty and like and i you know a story with that and so it's like that's kind of what like i feel like he he does that with like a lot of his other novels is like that's a big thing interesting okay y- yeah <laughs> and just man's struggle with art and mm-hmm. perverting it and twisting it like with an artist and and murder yes yeah You're perverting it and twisting it yeah 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 or a person going insane because they're so obsessed with chess and they can't stop seeing chess in their whole life. Like everything's chess. Everything's just different chess moves and stuff. It's like chess is the art and like the story is about, you know, maybe like intelligence versus emotional, like understanding of, you know, uh, how you approach life and huh. yeah. Okay. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's real smart. Okay. Yeah. So in 1940, they get out of Paris and lucky he was such a nerd for etymology because when the family decided Paris wasn't safe anymore, they applied to immigrate to the United States and they were granted visas due to Nobukov's background as a teacher and leopardologist. So they're like, oh, you run around the world and study butterflies? Like, that's cool. We actually kind of need somebody to come here and study butterflies. Yeah, I've like kind of mixed emotions on this, but just because I, I uh, you know, read a very fascinating book recently that I actually really wanted to tell you about. Mm. And it has to do with, and it really brings up this question of like political asylum or, you know, safety asylum. Right. And how just as a country based on people who basically emigrated since our forefathers and how we have this like weird desire to like turn people away, even if they're coming from a country that's absolutely in horrible chaos. And it's like, it's so Mm-hmm. and it's like so horrible but it's like well yeah i'm glad that he found a reason <laughs> well yeah and if you remember like 
1940, that's during a time when it's like the U.S. really put a lot of sanctions on any sort of European immigration. We're, mm-hmm. You know, that was a time when we're like, cool, Mexicans come in here and like work in our fields and stuff. We're down with like all of like South American kind of, kind of people, mostly Mexicans at the time. You know, like I just actually I just read a book on that. And so, <laughs> and so it's like it's like we're down with all of that. But like, no, 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 not those Europeans. We don't want the Europeans in here because they got a lot of screwed up stuff going on. And yeah, we don't we want don't screwed be, up stuff. We don't want to have our hands sticky in that. Yeah. You know, and so it's like essentially it's like he they got lucky with the fact that they're like because I because what happened is he I essentially, I guess, applied to work at Manhattan's uh, American Museum of Natural History, you know, because he's a big old butterfly nerd. Yeah. And they're all like, cool, butterfly nerd guy? Like, all right, you can come. You yeah. <laughs> so it's like, cool, because I'm glad that they got out because of his, like, super awesome interest. Yeah. But also it's like, God, it just reminds you that, like, oh, I know. It that just it's, hurts. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got lucky. He got real lucky. He got lucky. really lucky. Because he didn't study it in school. No. He, he didn't get the degree. He act, he studied it a little bit, but he didn't get a degree in that. He's just like, no, this is what I do for fun. Here's my work. And people are like, cool, come hang out with us. Yeah. So he found <laughs> this like awesome, that situation where you just find that right person at the right moment to help you get there. Yeah. And he yeah. was super lucky. Yeah. I like butterflies. Oh my gosh. We really need someone who likes butterflies. Yeah. Well, and it's like, <laughs> it was like when, when, with me and getting my credentials, like I had to, the, the, the state of Nevada said, you have to basically take four more classes before we're going to give you this credential. And I was like, mm. no, I'm so close. Like, please, no. And I just so happened to find this one person that was like, if you if you scan me or email me your credentials right now, I will just print it and pass it on through and I will sign it and you're good. Nice. So that's kind of like what I'm picturing yeah. for him too. It's like that one person who has a really good heart. Yeah, she's got a butterfly find... tattoo and she's just like, oh my gosh, this guy's saying he's going to come here and study our butterflies. Like, I'm so down. <laughs> I was thinking a little less Valley Girl and more of like, hey, I'm going to do anything I can to screw the system and get the people I can to get in yeah 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 these people have been through enough like yeah they clearly they're, they're russian jewish they like if you look at their history they lived in russia during like the worst time to live in russia they lived in berlin during the worst time to live in berlin they were there now they're coming from paris and it sounds like that's not a good situation either yeah, so let's like, get them over here this let's... person and I'm, I'm making it a she she yes. is because she's got her butterfly tattoo she's got or... her butterfly tattoo <laughs> but she's also doing what she can to to help the system in in mm-hmm. a man man's world and so i like this yeah she's i like, like i'm this. gonna buck this system i'm so gonna he, help this like awesome couple yeah you know yeah the Screw wife him. that's sitting there on the beach eating beautiful like cold cut sandwiches like mm. they're cool with her vodka, cute yeah. little son and yeah so they, they lucked out with this really good ne'er-do-well yes <laughs> that's what i'm picturing i'm doing a lot of imagination in this oh yeah you know we're we're totally uh taking his life over yes <laughs> turning into our it's fantasy now world. ours <laughs> Yeah, so he's there. He's yeah. He wasn't really working at Manhattan's American Museum. They, he was like a volunteer, but and then he got a job at um, Wesley, Wellesley. Oh, I can always I can never pronounce it right, correctly because it's my name and it's spelled almost exactly the same as my name, but with an oh, okay. W E L at the beginning. <laughs> Wellesley. Well, Wellesley. Wellesley. Yeah. So it's like saying like Well Leslie, you know. That's Wellesley. what that's how I see it. But then I have I know I can't pronounce it Well Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. I get it. Now. Wellesley. Okay, so uh, he's in New York. They've escaped. Mm-hmm. He gets a job at Wellesley as a lecturer in comparative literature, and he also becomes the curator of Leopardi lep- lep- at you know butterflies. Um, okay. yeah, probably good to say the butterfly thing um <laughs> at sorry people who are pissed off and like no it's this you know sorry well especially because the you. way you were saying it almost came off as like leprosy and i was like wait <laughs> anyway, when I started did that happen that too, and i'm like i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry and like <laughs> We try our best. <laughs> so he, yeah, so he becomes the curator for butterflies at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. And uh, so I'll say during his lifetime, he published 18 scientific papers on uh, etymology, mostly butterflies, obviously. Um, he collected over 4,000 types of butterflies and more than 20. He was the first to discover. And so he got to name them and he named them after characters in his novels from his novels. <laughs> Oh, how cool. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yeah. So he's big old butterfly guy. Yep. Like he's, okay. he's famously a butterfly guy because yeah. yeah, he named more than 20 species on his own. Yeah. 
after his own characters. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Yes. <laughs> so he became a U.S. naturalized citizen in 1945. And in the late 40s, he ends up he- heading and being actually the only uh, professor uh, for the, the Russian department at Wellesley. Um, <laughs> they're like, here's your own department. Like yeah. <laughs> you just have the whole department. Yes. <laughs> And so um, then at one point, his, a friend of his suggested that he should leave Wellesley and instead teach Russian and European le- literature at Cornell University. And so he does. Wow. So wow. He, he moved on to Cornell. This is a guy with just basically a bachelor's degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who just liked to go, like, he liked reading books and he liked studying butterflies. And so yeah. now he's like, but now he's, you know. It can happen, kids. Yeah. Total <laughs> you really watch like me. something. Yeah. <laughs> you can make it happen. Yeah. And a fun fact when he was at Cornell, uh, one of his students at the time was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, what? Uh, who would later claim Novikov as a great influence on her own writing. <gasps> That's kind of cool. Like, RPG? So she, she, yes. She, yeah. She took his like Russian, European literature, whatever kind of classes and stuff at Cornell. And uh, yeah. What? was really influenced by him <laughs> oh cool oh god this just gets better and better so while he's doing all of this and being like super awesome professor guy every summer he and vera would head to the west coast united states where they would go on more butterfly hunting expeditions and it was these trips where he started to write lolita so supposedly he was partly influenced by the 1948 kidnapping of sally horner who was an 11 year old girl who was kidnapped by this pedophile for 21 months. Mm. Yeah. It was like, she stole a notebook or something from a convenience store. And this guy was all like, I'm an FBI agent and, and ended up, you know, kidnapping her and taking her on this crazy oh, road God. trip thing. Well, and it's especially just because the FBI would not be care. questioning a child. But you're, yeah, exactly. But oh, then it's God. like when you're 11, you're just be like, Oh my God, I believe everything, you know? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and it's the forties. And so, you know, there's not this stranger. Yeah, the eighties hadn't happened yet. Yeah, exactly. The eighties hadn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> and... The moral of that story. Yes. The eighties hadn't happened yet. Yeah. Future children. Thank God the eighties have happened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We live in a world where things are much more tight knit, but you know, so it's, it's for a reason. For the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so there's a, a bunch of books and things written about how like Sally Horner is like the real Lolita and stuff like that. But, um, Nobokov literally mentions that kidnapping in Lolita. Like he has the character being like, Oh, well I'm not as bad as whatever the name of the guy who kidnapped Sally Horner was and stuff. Uh-huh. Like I'm much more clever or something. I don't know, whatever. And, uh, but like at the time there's like a lot of major differences. The book is not, at all similar to like Sally Horner's um, situation. And um, and also at the time when Novikov was writing the book and when Sally Horner happened, there actually wasn't a lot of articles or news sources about it. So it's like kind of, so I kind of feel like good for somebody who like is recognizing that this horrible thing happened to this girl back in the forties, you know, when it wasn't being, it wasn't some national, it wasn't this big thing. It was sort of like, Oh yeah, this guy's now on trial for this thing that happened. Yeah, just you kind know? of brushed under the rug. And yeah, it was brushed under the rug. This creepazoid needs to fry. Well, yeah, again, and, I don't and, want to and so, yeah, and so someone took that like fifty years later and it was all like, "Whoa, what happened? That's crazy!" And really kind of delved into the case. And so it's likely, you know, obviously we know Novikov knew about that story, but it wasn't like a national thing. And he was also, according to like his editor and stuff like that, he w- he was looking at a lot of different crazy news stories that were going on during that day and so i think if anything it was like yeah probably these weird pedophiles like being obsessed with girls and kind of kidnapping them like was kind of a thing back then and people just weren't recognizing it and that might have been part of his reason for wanting to write you know this book um to kind of you know show that because it's like yeah, but I think it was not just Sally Horner. There was a couple other things that were mm-hmm. going on that he's like, this is this is weird, and we need to talk about how weird this is. Okay, so, so you yeah. think, because I've actually never read Lolita. So it's you think so it's good. a conversation piece about how yeah. horrible this is? Oh, yeah, totally. Okay. Oh, God, yeah. Like, you, you should be kind of, like, freaked out and stuff. It's not a sexy book, and I think that's what everyone thinks, is they think it's going to be, like, all sexy and stuff. It's not a sexy book. Like there are moments that are like you you start to forget that he's an unreliable narrator. Um, but 
it's it's a lot of the times it's just like, oh my God, what is going on? But now I have to keep reading, but I am so freaked out, you know? Which is probably a good thing for yeah. people who are like, oh, you know, it's like freak- brush it under the rug. Let's pretend it's not happening. Yeah. It's like, oh no, no, this is freaky. Let's talk about this. Yeah. And it's, and, and like what, what he does is he makes it freaky because, because the way that the, because it's an unreal, if you're hearing it from like the pedophile's perspective and, and he's like, normal like he he's convincing you he's trying to convince you the reader like of this normalization or you know and 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 that's what makes that's why it's freaky because it's just like oh this is so yeah this is so gross like oh she was she's the one who made the first move and all you know and all of this stuff that it's just like "Ah!" (laughs) oh my god you know like but so it's so it's a so and you want to keep reading though because you're just like how are you so this insane but also like you can speak in this way that is just so you think you're normal you think what you're doing is okay you know and Uh and 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 i have to i have to know more like on a psychological level i have to know more about this what's going on in your fucking brain you know and you know the beginning kind of you know the forward and stuff like that which is also it's it's part like there's a forward, but it's not an actual forward. It's part of the book. Mm-hmm. And so you're, so it kind of tells you what's going to happen. And so you're just like, well, how does that happen? Like, I need to know, like, you know, mm-hmm. okay. Um, I'm intrigued, but I'm definitely going to need to be in like a right mindset for it. Yeah. 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 Oh, for sure. Yeah. Cause I'm glad but, that it's not like a romanticized sexy book. No, it's not sexy at all. And that it is actually like, Hey, this is fucked. Let's talk about this. Yeah. And yeah how yeah. can we change it for the better? Oh, totally. I feel like everyone should read it because it is just like really, uh, brings to light things in a way that and that's I think that's what people don't talk about with Lolita and I never saw the movie or anything but you know I think everyone thinks about it as this like sexualized like she's this like sexy girl and stuff like that and it's just like that is not at all what I'm seeing it's another unreliable character yeah where that's trying to convince you because I was thinking about that with with uh, Haunting of Hill House. She's not a first-person character. And you don't realize that it is this, like, that you are just dragged in her mind because it's not so obvious by being first-person. Yeah. And it's such a mind fuck. So to do it from a person that's doing a, terrible things. A creepy pedophile like, yes. psychopath. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah you got to take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, that's what, it's so well, I don't think anyone else can do a creepy pedophile file psychopath like character anymore like because yeah he he did it he 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 put that he's the only book on that shelf like Mm -hmm. (laughs) he's like nope this i'm gonna push it and yeah i like that he uses something where it's like you have to almost be i don't want to say empathetic but like in a way because it is a psychological thing like you you have to separate yourself interesting mm-hmm. it's like oh god okay yeah you have to be ready for something to like be like i'm gonna think about this yeah so you can't just do this as a beach read people oh no 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 but it's an easy read it's an easy read but it's it's an intense easy read i even think for like high school kids should read it like and that's maybe the most controversial you know but i feel like if you read it in high school at least you have like the guidance of somebody helping you through like the reading and like like you know processing like the different thoughts and like you know how to think about these different things that are happening in different chapters that are like but I'm also somebody who like you know read Shakespeare when I was 10 so So I might be skewed on on what's what's appropriate for children we are actually also the unreliable characters yeah 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 when I say you know maybe at least I don't know like being your if you're in your if you're already in your 20s you should probably read Lolita like just there's a reason why it's still on like a number one book list like or not number one but on one of those top 50 top 100 yeah you have to read before you die kind of list because it's yeah and it's really well written the prose and stuff and like you know like how he talks about life he goes back and forth between english and french at times which is really interesting uh yeah so i mean it's just the way he uses language on its own is just worth it regardless of the subject matter interesting (laughs) okay sounds like i might have a read at some point i don't know when but (laughs) i I will have to be in a very specific place for it yes and nobokov wrote 
Quote, a creative writer must study carefully the works of his rivals, including the Almighty. He must possess the unborn capacity not only of recombining, but of recreating the given world. In order to do this adequately, avoiding duplication of labor, the artist should know the given world. Imagination without knowledge leads no further than the backyard of primitive art. <laughs> heavy <laughs> yeah there's a lot going on there. yeah you got a lot you're questioning art everything that would i think that would be a whole hour dissecting that specific quote just well, to show yes. that kind of person. our future patreon uh <laughs> yes we will talk about quotes and dissect the quote mm-hmm. a whole nother conversation <laughs> So, in fact, Novikov has written that his, he first started to come up with the idea of Lolita when he was living in Paris in 1940, and he had written a short story that was very similar back then, but after reading it to some friends, he decided that he hated it and, quote, destroyed it sometime after moving to America in 1940. Okay. And this becomes a common theme for Novikov, to destroy his works that he didn't think was any good. Mm -hmm. Um, while he was out butterfly hunting in Colorado, Arizona, Oregon, he, uh, would regularly try to destroy first drafts of Lolita, but, uh, Vera always stopped him from doing, doing it. Like, no, you can't do that. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. You're like, I hate this. I'm going to throw it in the fire. And she's like, no, 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 no. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Uh, Just it was to show his own personal struggle with writing something so psychologically yes screwed up for lack of a better yeah, term yeah, yeah 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 oh totally oh yeah it's like, I feel, the, it's I feel like, like a Heath Ledger type thing the novel. yeah you can feel it in the novel too where it's just like because he puts so much of himself he talks about like tennis and chess and at, at even some points like he mentions like you know oh this pretty butterfly or something and i'm just like oh my god you put so much of yourself in this novel oh, in this hard. character and like the characters wants and likes and stuff like that must have been so fucking hard to do like yeah. that must have been just that must have messed with your head yeah yeah like, like to yeah. he can't come across like a creep but no. he is the creepiest worst person ever yeah. so it's just like damn man like oh so he's like putting his like own innocence into it yeah he's like i'm tearing parts of my own innocence yeah into this character so that it is not so easy Mm -hmm. on the reader yeah wow i know joseph i know okay (laughs) (laughs) i know it's like oh okay never mind we did need this strong drink I was like at the beginning, like, oh, this is great. This oh. is fine. Happy go lucky episode. Little did I know. <laughs> I mean, I knew a little bit of Lily, and I knew it couldn't be super duper happy, but yeah, didn't think it would be so heart wrenching. Yeah, for yeah, like the idea of like how he wrote it, mm-hmm. actually, which, which would actually be a really good movie, is like a movie about Vladimir Novikov while he's trying to write Lolita. I mean, his whole life Ooh. would be a great movie. In he's 19- part of the Best Friends Club, right? Yeah, he's totally part of the Best Friends Club. Okay, good. I want to hear him talk with Oscar Wilde. I think. They oh. would have- Oh my Such god! Crazy, and then comments. Dorothy Parker's just like chiming in. Yeah, and she'd just be giving these little one-liners on the corner, oh like god. you know, and then so Colette's good. out there dancing on the side, and like and it's just like also <laughs> whispering like, something secret maybe to she's no- like Dorothy. hitting on Mary Shelley too. Yes, yes. She's just like, oh my god, Mary Shelley, you're super goth and awesome. Yes. <laughs> Best friends club. Best friends club. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Herman Melville sitting in the pool, just, just like, like sipping on some <gasps> Mai Tai or something. Yeah, he's just like, all you people, go to the <laughs> South Pacific, you'll feel different. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, all like, dude, I get you. Yeah, got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I so want to hang out with all these people now. <laughs> oh, so... It was in 1953 when the family was finally in Ashland, Oregon. Hey, what? Shakespeare Shut Festival. Shut the front door! <laughs> shout out! <laughs> Booyah, motherfucker. Yeah. I gotta give a shout out because I have been attending the Shakespeare <laughs> Festival until it shut down because of COVID for 20 years. That's why I had to actually put in just like Ashland, Oregon, not just like in Oregon, you know? He's yeah. in Ashland, Oregon, boop, boop. 1953, and that's when he finally finished the novel. Wow. Yeah. So freaking cool, but I know. so sad that it's such a psychologically crazy book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so then 
not what he expected at all. It becomes a huge success being first published in English in France because America was kind of like, I don't know about that. Mm, and <laughs> type censorship. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 That was, Eng- uh, that was America for you. Um, and then it was published in the U S so then he decides, Oh, I can quit teaching and I can work full time as an author and study butterflies <laughs> <laughs> yay the, dream the, the level of happiness on your face too <laughs> Woo! <laughs> gonna quit my job i gotta write and study butterflies oh my god <laughs> that is actually the dream but would you would you study butterflies or what would you do i don't know what i would do but i feel like i'd want to do something like look under a microscope and be kind of crazy and you know i don't know what though but i would have fun doing something like that if I could quit everything because I had a successful writing career, I think it would be fish. <laughs> fish, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like you have to choose something. You can't be like, oh, I'm Indiana Jones, like everyone no, no, else. No, like no, you, no. But, but I would study. I would want to like look at something or maybe I'd play with chemistry stuff or I don't know, okay, you know, so I'd end up blowing myself up in a garage and you know, yeah, <laughs> five years like after I retired, get but you I would outside that you're like, I'm writing inside. I'm studying, researching, doing all that stuff. What do you do? You step outside mm-hmm. and no, I would do trees. I love trees. Oh, trees are cool. Trees yeah. Are, or ornithology. I love birds. You know what? I always loved um uh the tide pools and looking at all the different like sea creatures and stuff. You know, it's and I love I yeah. love I love telling people I love doing so that. You have so I probably do at the, at the beach then. Yeah, so I guess I would I, I, that's what I would do. I guess I would have to do that. I have to go retire out, and I would I would, you know, go study like weird moss and weird like tie pooled creatures or something while you're writing in your little beach set yeah whereas yeah, yeah. mine because i'm a tree or birds mm-hmm. i would have well to so then the maybe mountains. i would study moss so then i could still be in the mountains you could do that i would like, study different yeah exactly yeah. i'll study an algae like lake algae and stuff oh yeah you know Go i could still Crowley. study They've yeah exactly I, I, yeah i could study like lake like that would be f- actually i know i want to buy a microscope and go look at the <laughs> <lake> algae <laughs> from Al- <laughs> Crowley. okay Another subject. Yes. Another podcast. This has been like a very tangenty <laughs> podcast, but I think it's because like we're so excited about him. Yeah. That he cool. makes us excited about other weird things uh, that we want to yeah, be embrace, weird about. Yeah. Embrace ourselves. He, yeah. That's his whole thing. He's weird about things that are not literature things. He's like, I love butterflies and all I want to do is study butterflies all the time. I and like, it. I can't wait till I can retire and just study butterflies. Like for fun. Yeah. Just for fun. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I think this has been a lot of tangents is because he's, he's that cool. Like he, he is, is cool. probably one of the coolest. He is. He's so cool. Okay. I'm almost done with him too. So. <laughs> oh. Um, so he's still alive. <laughs> So in 1961, Vladimir and Vera move back to Europe They're, and they reside at the Palace Hotel um, on Lake Geneva in Switzerland, where he ended up translating some of uh, Pushkin's most difficult works like Eugene Ongin, which like, so he's the one who, who pop, like made Pushkin go from being just, you know, crazy Russian guy that everyone loves and is like, how do we do this? You know, like, it's like translating Joyce. Like Joyce is so like, how do you translate Joyce into another language? Because it's so specifically written like this English, but with this Irish kind of thing. And, Mm -hmm. and so it's like, that's what Pushkin is for Russian literature. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that people who speak English can like study Pushkin is essentially because of Nobokov, which I'm like, Oh my God, that's so cool. That is cool. (laughs) That is cool. Yeah. (laughs) Oh God, I love him. Yeah. (laughs) He published an autobiography and of course he's hunting for butterflies while he's all out in Switzerland. So, in fact, today at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, there's Nobokov's, uh, quote, butterfly genitalia cabinet. (laughs) Yes, because a lot of the species of butterflies that he discovered were based on how uh, he would look at, like, the male butterfly genitalia under a microscope. And so he'd be able to, like, spot the differences in the species. And so some of those 20 different species, it was basically like, you see like three butterflies flying around. They're all blue or whatever, but he'd be like, he'd be like, I'm going to dissect them and look at their genitalia. And that's how he's like, Nope, this is a different species from this one. Well, he probably looked at more than just the genitalia, but noticed like a big difference between the genitalia. It's pretty funny. Like who, like no one else thought about doing that. And so then they're like, Oh my God. Oh my God. That's amazing. (laughs) He was looking at butterfly cocks. Yeah, butterfly dicks all day. And he's like, this, th- these dicks are different than these dicks. Is it weird that I'm more in love with him now? <laughs> I 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, kid who takes apart the toaster and wants to know how it works and then realizes this toaster is different than this toaster. <laughs> because of its genitalia. <laughs> Toaster genitalia. What yes. A weird thing. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, same kind of fascination, something outside of the norm, probably if you studied it. But yeah. Also, when he's older, he gets back into chess. He starts uh, to compose chess problems, which were published in the chess journal, The Problemist. So, oh my God. yeah. Of course. Like, of course. Like, he's, just, he's, he's, I mean, <laughs> we need a crown. Crown, crown him. him the nerd of all nerds. He's the nerd of all nerds. Like, he paved the way for it all. God, absolutely. Like, he might as well have a pocket protector and like be named poindexter he's like yes i'm, I'm gonna ex- you know make some chess problems this evening and then this <laughs> after afternoon I spent the morning studying butterflies yeah yeah and then writing a bit of a novel <laughs> <laughs> i love him i love him nerd nerd of nerd. all nerds nerd nerd <laughs> love it our type of guy yes <laughs> in the mid 1970s he began working on his novel the ori- the or- original or the origin of Laura and knowing that he was going to die before it was published. He asked his son and wife to burn it after he died, um, which was July 2nd, 1977. Um, But instead Vera placed it in a Swiss bank vault. And in 2009, his son Dimitri decided to have it published, even though it was incomplete. (gasps) Wow. Yes. Wow. How cool. Yes. (laughs) Just, and, yes. <laughs> yes. How cool. Yes. Totally. Period. They're That's like, it. No, we're not going to let you burn your stuff anymore, kid. Like, <laughs> we watched you do that a lot. We're yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. And we know you're writing this and you think you're going to die before you finish it. And you probably will. But like when you do die, we're not going to just burn it. We're going to, yeah. you know, but it's interesting. Yeah. That, you know, it wasn't published until 2009. In an interview before he died, he said, quote, I believe that one day a repraiser will come and declare that far from having been a frivolous firebird, I was a rigid, rigid moralist, kicking sin, cuffing stupidity, ridiculing the vulgar and cruel and assigning sovereign power to tenderness, talent, and pride. Wow. So that is Nobokov. I love Nobokov. Yeah. Uh, he has a literary award named after him. It's a, the pen slash Nobokov award for achievement in international literature wow which is given to a writer born or living outside of the united states whose work is written or translated into english wow kind of like the foreign version of a academy award (laughs) (laughs) yeah oh yeah and then to get back to like the emoji thing that i mentioned at the very beginning yeah i'm so intrigued i've been waiting for that the whole time i know right (laughs) where is the emoji coming yes from when he was born in the 1800s. <laughs> to now, in uh, a 1969 interview, Nobokov, um, you know, who's known for having this very profound way of using language, he speaks multiple languages, and so he knows how to even just, I can't say this word in English, so I'm going to use another language and mm-hmm. just put it in there and fuck it, you know? Um, uh, he mentioned that there should be a symbol that represents a smiley face so that authors are better suited to show emotion in written works, not just you know, write about the emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Insert emoji. Yes, exactly. I love that. Yeah. So I think he'd be super down with the emojis because because he'd be like, like, oh my god, I can totally to convey this emotion. This. Yeah. Through this little tiny picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so into it. Yeah. He's like, you know what? There should be something out there for this. <laughs> That's so cool. When I think, you know, and in, in writing, like, yeah, the unreliable narrator thing, if he could put, like, an upside-down emoji or something, you know, to be, like, <laughs> you know, or a clown face or something. Yeah, like, like... Like, to be, like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> I'm going all Jack Nicholson and The Shining right now with this passage, you know? <laughs> I'm glad you brought up The Shining, because, yeah, that's actually a really interesting... <laughs> not unreliable character as well yeah and conveyed in a movie too he's he's, very well oh yeah yeah because he yeah because he's seen as like the protagonist from Mm -hmm. the beginning and then you realize oh no he's 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 the the antagonist yeah he's the the bad guy yeah and uh yeah that's i but then i've never because he's i've never either but like that's where we have to get your sister on the podcast she can tell us all about it she (laughs) worships stephen king um 
because but from just like the movie perspective yes he's the protagonist yeah he's telling the story but even then like while he's going in through this like psychological like is it magic is it just cabin mm. fever you never know because it's still just him and him like see going into the bar with stanley or you know right the bartender with stanley right maybe Oh, it's been a year since I've watched it. I usually watch it every Halloween. Wait, is um, that the name of the hotel? The Stanley Hotel? The... I don't remember. Um, or maybe, okay, anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> just like him like going into these like weird mm-hmm. reveries. Is it is it just him being crazy? Is it yeah. this mat- Like you never know if it's just him like being like imaginative or what. So, oh my God. I'm so glad he, oh my God, Stephen King and Nobokov would have been really good friends too. Yeah, exactly. I will, I will put those books next to each other on my shelf and hopefully they'll have like good conversations. I don't oh, have yes. a Stephen King, but you know, when I do get a Stephen King, I'll. <laughs> well, that was an amazing, amazing story. And my guess is for the, um, cause that's what also. We yes. Do. Yes. Guess the drink. Guess, guess the, the drink. drink. <clears throat> okay. Vodka. Cause he's Russian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saint Germain is kind of French. Elderflower, mm-hmm. nature. I can smell elderflower while frolicking with the butterflies. Okay, yeah, yeah. Or that could also be applied to the blackberry liqueur. Blackberry, blueberry, blackberry. Blackberry. Blackberry liqueur. Um, it's sweet. Like, I know he would be if I ever actually got to be best friends with him. <laughs> um, but kind of tangy. Because he obviously was, like, a nerdy, tangy person. Yeah, introvert. Introvert. Um, and just a really good cocktail for how great he is. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I was trying to go with, like, I didn't want to go full-on, like, Britney Spears butterfly kind of, you know, or Mariah Carey butterfly, <laughs> you know, imagery. It's like, I wanted it to be kind of, you know, a subdued nature And that's why I was, like, thinking elderflower you know, Black it's like, berry, yeah. yeah, you know, like fun nature things, but without it being like overpoweringly sweet and, um, cause silly. he did write Lolita. <laughs> yes, he did write And Lolita. <laughs> the, uh, psychopath who thought himself an artist. Yes. Well, wow. What a cool story. Yes. I liked thanks. that one. <laughs> I liked it a lot. Yes. Sorry to our listeners that we've been, uh, not recording too much this month. Because we've been busy with uh, the world opening up and getting the out there. Opening, yep. and We're going to have to start figuring out things. the shift of like the world opening up. Also, to be fair, I did have a spring break. So Yes, exactly. She's a teacher. She had a spring break. Like It's normal. <laughs> we live in a cold place and I needed to go thaw out. So <laughs> I went and thawed. Yes. So that's the way it is. But, yeah. but we'll be back to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on Instagram. And... Yes. Things like that. And you can always find us. And <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> We're technically also on Twitter and Facebook. Tell your friends. If you really like us, please tell your friends. And if you do like us, actually, you can like message us. and We would love we, to know that somebody other hearing. than our own selves are listening. <laughs> we have like 100 regular listeners right now at this point. I don't but see those thank numbers. Thank you, UK. We love you. Like Yay. our new big pop of a country is the UK. So love Yay. you guys. Oh, my God. I'm totally an Anglophile. So yes. I love you. <laughs> I studied English so I could go to England someday. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you ever have anything to say, as long as you're nice, like, please like tell us and talk to us and like, we, we just love it. Small town girls living in yeah. a small town world. Yeah. Trying to not be journey songs, <laughs> not be journey songs, <laughs> not be journey songs, but also bring authors to your living room because we forget the people who wrote the books. We celebrate the books, but mm-hmm. sometimes we forget who the people like they're actually people behind it yeah they were cool they were really cool all right well thank you so much okay bye uh, bye. (laughs) sources for this episode include vladimirnovikov.org novikov and some poets of russian modernism by simon korolinsky i'm guessing this was like a dissertation sorry strong opinions by vladimir novikov Nobokov, The Mysteries of Literary Structures by Leona Toker, or Toker, T-O-K-E-R, and, of course, Encyclopedia Britannicals article written by Melissa Albert. By the way, she wrote the Hip Witch Hazel series, and it's really good. Okay.